Anyway, I'll see here. Something to make a video with. Oh, how about a dead rat? Let's chuck him in this guy here. I've just recently gotten back from a trip to Colombia where I was making a bit of extra money performing discount BBL operations, and the whole thing got me thinking, being a doctor isn't really that hard. So with that in mind, let's play doctor in this video by revisiting the x-ray machine. A few months back I built this DIY x-ray machine which actually worked pretty well, but it's a bit clunky and the 2mm lead shielding I used probably wasn't enough. There was a lot of stray radiation coming off that machine, so I had to be pretty far away and operate it with a remote control when I wanted to take a picture. So I started designing an aluminum housing for my x-ray tube to help filter out some of those lower energy particles that don't contribute to the picture and are just energetic enough to give you cancer. And I also started stacking up as much lead sheeting as I could possibly get my hands on. But in the middle of doing that, one of my Patreon members, who wishes to remain anonymous, sent me a fully working dental x-ray unit. Now when you get a gift this cool, you don't just let it become a paperweight in the shop, so let's turn it into a CT scanner. I was already planning on doing this with my original x-ray machine, but having a real one will make it a lot easier and less likely to irradiate me. The unit consists of four main parts. We've got a display head interface type thing for the operator, a logic board with some software on it, and a power supply board for the x-ray head itself. So I guess this is going to be the H-bridge that drives the high voltage transformer and also the supply for the tube filament. And finally here's the head itself which contains the high voltage transformer, x-ray tube, shielding, filters, etc. The head is the part that the dentist sticks in your face that's usually on a big arm assembly thing and the rest of the equipment lives in a box that's typically mounted on the wall. Although recently a lot more x-rays are portable battery powered units. I'm not going to do the extra work to make this thing fully battery powered, but I'm going to make it fairly portable by repackaging all of it into an enclosure approximately the size of a big lunchbox. But first, just a quick test to verify functionality. I plug in the display head to the logic board with an ethernet cable and then had to make this jumper cable thing that goes from the logic board to one of the connectors on the head. Then I connected what appear to be some logic pins between the power supply and the logic board and finally what appears to be a power connection to the head itself. Here's the whole thing set up on a table ready to test. I'll put a small intensifying screen in front of the head with my thermocouple meter as a target and then I'll power up the unit. Okay, the screen comes up, so that's a good start. The interface is pretty self-explanatory and easy to use. The maximum power setting is 6 milliamps at 70 kilovolts with a maximum exposure time of 1 second. To fire it, I just hold down the button and the x-ray fires for the preset time. Picture looks pretty dim, but this was during the middle of the afternoon and I couldn't get my room very dark, so that's to be expected, but everything is working perfectly. A CT scan takes hundreds of images, so obviously it's not going to work for me to just sit there and press the button each time because I'll get really bored and probably irradiate it too. Fortunately the firing button is just a simple single pull switch, so I'll just solder some leads onto the PCB that'll allow me to close the switch with a microcontroller driven relay. Next, I'll mount the pieces of the assembly onto wooden boards which will go inside a wooden box. The x-ray head will go on one board and all the PCBs and other electronics I'll add will go on another one. The power supply board will be screwed onto the wood and the logic board will sit on top of it with this funny 3D printed adapter thing I designed. Then the wooden boards are screwed together with some outer panels using these 3D printed brackets. Next I add the control circuit. This is an Arduino that will control a relay to turn the x-ray on and get the images and control the turntable stepper motor based on the number of images taken which will be selected by a potentiometer. The setup also has a buck converter to convert 12 volts to 5 volts to run the LCD backlight because doing it with the Arduino's linear regulator can make it pretty hot. Here's a diagram of the whole setup. Once all that is in place, I paint the box, add some decals to make it look semi-presentable, add a little collar to the output lens thing, and then I printed this interface panel for controlling the scan. With this, you can dial in the number of images for the program to take across a 360 degree sweep, and you can manually turn the stepper motor with it too. I also added this switch to toggle between single x-ray and CT scan mode, but it was totally unnecessary because I remembered the original interface module still works to do that. I didn't feel like reprinting, so there's just a switch here that does nothing. I didn't have a proper dedicated camera, so I'm using an old phone, and I need a way to trigger it to take a picture when the x-ray turns on. There are several software solutions to doing this, but they're all kind of annoying, so I'm going to do it the brute force way with hardware. This is done with a little spring-loaded pin that pushes a wire up against some conductive tape on the screen of the phone where the picture button is. The wire and tape are electrically connected to the phone case via a small relay when it's time to take a picture and this electrical contact triggers the touchscreen to go off.
The beeping is from my multimeter, but it'll be the switch for the x-ray that's closing when I do the actual CT scan. All right, that seemed to work. Now let's try it with the actual x-ray running. For a first test subject, I'll try scanning this 5-volt wall wart. I'm going to start off with just 20 images, but to get a decent resolution for a 3D model, I found you typically want at least 100 images. I have the x-ray set to fire for half a second at 60 kilovolts and 4 milliamps, which is on the lower end of the power settings for this model. My camera is set to half a second exposure though, so it makes up for the lower output. The x-ray isn't designed to run continuously, and it'll overheat if it does, so I put a 20 second delay between each firing. The logic board on the unit will prevent it from being turned on if it detects the tube is over a certain temperature, but I don't even want to get near that point to begin with because I don't want to risk damaging this thing. The camera was successfully synchronized to the x-ray, and the picture is pretty sharp, but as you can tell there's still a lot of hot pixels from being directly in the beam, so I'll eventually need to rig up a periscope for the camera. For now I'm going to proceed as is and see whether or not the hot pixels present a major problem for making the 3D model. I just need a test subject now, so I managed to get a hold of a pest control guy who provided me with a dead rat. I've named him Dave. I freeze the rat solid, then put it in a clear cup that I've glued to the rotor and wedge it in place with some styrofoam, which should be a low enough density that it doesn't really show up on the x-ray. Okay, so everything worked and we've got a nice 360 degree sweep of our rat. It's actually pretty funny how similar the skeleton looks to the squirrel I x-rayed in a previous video. I guess that's why they call them tree rats. As you can see, the noise from radiation on the digital sensor is pretty major in some of the frames, so I expect this will impact the quality of the CT model. Before these can be loaded into CT software, they need to be converted to grayscale, color inverted, and the brightness, contrast, and sharpness need to be touched up a little bit. That's a bit of a process in and of itself, so if you're interested in knowing how to do that, I've provided a link in the description that shows how you can do it with GIMP. So after a bunch of tedious and annoying button pressing, we've got a nice set of grayscale images that are ready for use. The software I'll be using for processing the images is a free program called 3D Slicer, which sounds like something that should be for 3D printing, but it's actually for CT scan data. To import the scan images, you go up to the top left and select data, and then select the directory that all the CT scan images are in. Then I select volume rendering from this drop down menu, which will allow me to see my images as a 3D model. This doesn't look quite right though. After squinting at it for a second, I realized that these funny sinusoidal patterns are because the program is expecting images based on translational slices, not based on rotation. I couldn't find any setting to change this, although I did find this program that takes the rotational projections and turns them into vertical slices, which basically works by looking at the brightness levels along the same vertical lines in each rotational slice, and then turning those into a weighted volumetric point cloud. Seemed to work pretty good though. Here's a sweep of the rotational images, and now here's a sweep of the slices going vertically, exactly the same as when you use the cutaway view tool like in some CAD programs. Okay, now that we have the images translated into vertical slices, let's try this again. And that's what I was trying to get. You can see that as I adjust this slider called shift, it basically adjusts the threshold for what's being displayed based on the pixel brightness, or rather the voxel brightness, since this is a three-dimensional image. Now this doesn't have to be a purely linear thing, you can actually adjust the threshold or gains in this window here, and you can sort of see how that looks as I drag around the slider and the render changes. So now we've got to turn this into a usable 3D mesh for 3D printing. To do that, we're going to go down to the segmentation tool and select segment editor and click add, then click the threshold tool to adjust our threshold then click show in 3D and hit apply. And now we've got an actual 3D mesh rather than just a cloud of voxels. Just like before, dialing the threshold up or down includes or excludes more or less material. For example, if we turn the threshold way down, the mesh just becomes a fuzzy cube because it's including all the voxels into the calculation and it slows down the computer a ton. Conversely, if we turn the threshold up, we're just sort of left with sparse blobs floating in midair. So obviously it's going to take a little bit of fine tuning to figure out the optimal threshold to use for the mesh to be printed. If I show the two dimensional views, the slices being calculated in the mesh are actually highlighted in green and we can go in and manually add or remove mesh for each 2D slice using the paint or erase tools, which is extremely powerful for tweaking a mesh, removing unwanted burrs or artifacts and so forth. Here's an example of a bit of painting I did on one of the 2D views showing up as a thin sheet of material because it was just one two-dimensional slice. So obviously it would be really tedious to build up or remove volume slice by slice like this. The faster way to tweak the mesh is to use the 3D paint and erase tool which allows you to work directly on the 3D mesh but it can be a little bit slow depending on how much horsepower your computer has. If you have your threshold set pretty low, you'll tend to have these floating islands around the object you scanned. 
You can get rid of them all in one click by using the islands tool and bam, they're gone. And finally, there's a mesh smoothing tool, which is really great for ironing out a lot of the noisy geometry caused by low resolution images, or in my case, the hot pixels from radiation. A couple iterations of that, and we've actually got something that looks worth 3D printing. There's a lot more tools than the ones I've shown, but I figure these are good enough to get an image turned into a 3D print. I'll click the Segmentations Module button, which is this green arrow, and then scroll down to the Export section and click Models, and then click Export. Then I'll go up to the top left and hit Save, uncheck everything except the bottom row, and then change the file format to STL, select a directory, and hit Save. Then we'll load up that STL, and the slicer makes some G-code for it without any errors, so it looks like we're good to start a 3D print. And now we've got kind of a skull and a bit of a spinal cord. It's at least got the basics, the teeth, the jawbone, the inside is hollow, and we've got sort of an impression in the areas for the eye sockets. The images with the body of the rat were just 400 by 400 pixels though, and a lot of that was contaminated with hot pixel noise from the radiation, so there's a lot of room for improvement. I also did a print that was just the outer surface of the rat's body, and that seemed to conform to the real shape pretty well, although if I just wanted the outer surface, I didn't need an x-ray, I could have just done that with an optical or infrared 3D scan. Let's try another test subject. It's almost Halloween, so I've got a bunch of pumpkins laying around, so how about this funny little star-shaped one? This scan actually came out pretty good despite the hot pixels, and we can actually kind of see what looks like seed patterns inside the pumpkin. Using the same procedure as before, I convert the images to a 3D mesh and generate some G-code to print. The first print is the outside model, which matches the original pretty closely. But there's another important thing we can see here, which is that the inside is hollow. There's a really interesting feature here about halfway up, where there seems to be two cavities in the pumpkin, which we wouldn't have been able to tell from external optical imaging. So let's cut the original open at the same point and see if the double cavity is really there. Preferably without chopping my fingers off in the process. The second cavity isn't quite as dramatic as the CT model portrayed it, but there's still an area on the left that has uh, sort of really low density fibers that you could just pick out with your fingernail, whereas the surrounding material is really hard and dense. So purely on the basis of density, it was sort of an accurate prediction. Next I tried a frozen sardine. I was hoping to get a cool fish skeleton model, but I was only able to resolve the outer surface and stink up the room as the fish started to thaw. And finally I got this big fish head, which will hopefully give me a slightly better detailed model on account of its larger size. The price is pretty hard to beat, too. Okay, that's pretty cool. I think I'm gonna make that a decoration in my office. All right, so there you have it, a DIY CT scanner that produces some real results. I was lucky enough to be provided with a real commercial x-ray unit for this, but it could absolutely be made to work with a homemade x-ray system like I built in my earlier video, although I wouldn't recommend being anywhere near it while it's running. The final product could certainly use some polishing between eliminating the radiation dots with a system of mirrors and generating voxel models larger than 400 pixels, but I think this project has shown that a homemade CT scanner for mapping internal geometry of stuff is definitely doable. Okay, that's the end of the video. Bye.